This is Saudi Arabia, which is noted for its harsh temperature, deserts, and low rainfall. But heavy rainfall in the last few weeks has resulted in a startling discovery. Saudi Arabia's landscape is altering in ways that have scientists stunned. If you want to learn more about what is going on in this Western Asian country, watch today's video till the end. Saudi Arabia and its land Saudi Arabia is an arid, thinly populated Middle Eastern kingdom. It takes up most of the Arabian Peninsula and has a land area of about 2.15 million square kilometers. This makes it the fifth largest country in Asia, the second largest in the Arab world, and the largest in Western Asia and the Middle East. Saudi Arabia is the only country that has a coastline on both the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. Most of the country is made up of arid deserts, lowlands, steppe, and mountains. The Arabian Peninsula is mostly made up of a plateau that rises sharply from the Red Sea and gently falls towards the Persian Gulf. In the north, the western highlands are more than 5,000 feet above sea level. They drop to about 4,000 feet near Medina and rise to more than 10,000 feet in the southeast. Most people think that Mount Saad, which is in the south near Ab, is the highest point in the country. Its height is thought to be between 10,279 and 10,522 feet. In the north, the peninsula's watershed is only 25 miles from the Red Sea. Near the Yemen border, it is 80 miles away. The Tiamat, which is the name of the coastal plain, is almost non-existent in the north, except for a few wadi deltas. However, it gets a little bigger in the south. The impressive escarpment that runs parallel to the Red Sea has a gap northwest of Mecca, but it's easier to see that it's all one thing in the south. As you go deeper into the desert, the land gradually falls away until you reach the wide plateau of the Naj. This area is covered with lava flows and volcanic debris, as well as occasional sand deposits. The plateau slopes down from about 4,500 feet in the west to about 2,500 feet in the east. There, the water flow is more clearly dendritic or branching, and it covers a much larger area than the flow to the Red Sea. This area is 750 miles long and curves east from north to south. It is surrounded on the east by a series of long, low ridges with steep slopes on the west and gentle slopes on the east. The Uwak Mountains are the most prominent of the ridges. They rise from the plateau about 2,800 feet above sea level and reach more than 3,500 feet southwest of Riyadh. They tower over the plateau surface by at least 800 feet to the west. Inside the Arabian Peninsula, there are large areas of sand. The Rub al Khali, or Empty Quarter, is the largest sand area in the world. It is in the southern part of the country and covers more than 250,000 square miles. It drops from more than 2,600 feet near the border with Yemen to almost sea level near the Persian Gulf. Some of the sand mountains, especially in the eastern part, reach heights of 250 meters. In the north-central part of the country, there is a smaller area of sand called Al Naf. It is about 22,000 square miles in size. Al Don, which is almost 900 miles long and only 30 miles wide in some places, connects Al Naf to the Rub Al Khali. As the plateau slowly slopes down to the Gulf from east to west, there are many salt flats and marshes. The coast of the Gulf of Mexico is not straight and the water is very shallow. The country has almost no permanent surface streams, but there are a lot of wadis. Those that go to the Red Sea are short and steep, except for Wadi Al Am, which starts near Medina and flows inland to the northwest for 100 miles before turning west. Those that go east are longer and more developed, except in Al Naf and the Rub Al Khali. The soil is not well developed. Pebbles of different sizes cover a lot of space. In wadis, basins, and oases, you can find alluvial deposits. In the east, there are a lot of salt flats. Arabian Desert People lived in Saudi Arabia's deserts more than 8,000 years ago, when they were lush and full of life. Today, what's left of these towns that have been gone for a long time still stands, frozen, or more accurately, dried out by time. From the air, researchers have seen thousands of huge stone structures all over the Arabian Peninsula, from Jordan to Saudi Arabia, Syria, Armenia, Kazakhstan, and Iraq. In the 1920s, British Air Force pilots were the first to notice the V-shaped arrangements. For more than a century, experts have debated why they were built. Recent satellite images and drone surveys in Saudi Arabia's Uwairi Desert back up what many people have thought for a long time. Archaeologists who study these ancient stone patterns, which are sometimes called desert kites, think that they were probably used to catch a lot of animals at once. Dozens of desert kites that had never been seen before were recently found in Uwairi. They all seem to have been made with the same purpose in mind. 
Some of the V-shapes lead to a pit, others to a sudden cliff, and still others to an enclosure. All three designs show that desert kites were once used to herd wild animals to their deaths or to places where they could be kept. Most people agree that the shape of a kite has a purpose. Animals were driven or led into a small area by the walls of the structure. The most common use of these structures is now thought to be hunting animals. Most often gazelles and other herbivorous ungulates like ibex, wild equids, and ostriches. More digging needs to be done to find out exactly what animals were herded into the recently found traps, but the fact that they have been found in other parts of the Arabian Peninsula suggests this was a common and successful way to stay alive. For instance, archaeologists have discovered hundreds of stone kites and thousands of other stone buildings scattered throughout the desert further to the south. The kites in the desert to the south of the Uweri Desert tend to be more complicated and concentrated. As you can see in the picture below, they sometimes put together more than one V-shape. Archaeologists have thought in the past that these structures were used as hunting traps because they are often found in sandy areas where there used to be seasonal grasslands. Gazelles, goats, and other animals that herd would have probably traveled through the greenery. Ancient rock art from this time shows that structures that look like kites were used to funnel animals. Some kites look like they could have been used to raise wild animals, which would have been one of the first attempts to tame animals anywhere in the world. A new study on desert kites that came out in April 2022 says that it's not unusual for different kinds of kites to live in the same area. Some of these kites end in pits, while others end in small enclosures. According to researchers, to kites and open kites may have been used at the same time, defining similar but different hunting techniques. They may have also happened at the same time, with one technique leading to the other. Forms of protokites may have come before the sophisticated, standardized forms of desert kites. To tell the difference between these two possibilities, more research is needed. The picture of Neolithic society could help us figure out how people first started hunting and taming animals. Maybe the first time we were able to breed and raise wild herds as our own was because we were able to get close to them, but not everything about these desert kites is always useful. Some kites have been found inside even bigger stone structures called mustatils, which can be kilometers long. The Arabic word for a rectangle is mustatil, and a block pattern of mustatils looks a bit like a gate when viewed from above. Archaeologists have found a lot of mustatils in the Arabian desert over the past few years, but they still don't know what they were used for. They could have been religious or cultural landmarks for animal sacrifices or feasts, but the fact that they look like desert kites suggests they could have been also used to keep animals together or store water. Whatever these stone structures were used for, they must have been very good at what they did or were very important. They are all over the area, and early attempts to date them show that they have been used for thousands of years on the Arabian Peninsula. The researchers who wrote the April study of last year say almost nothing is known about who uses megatraps in the kite distribution area. More dating needs to be done, and related sites need to be dug up so that they can clearly be linked to cultural facies. Since the 1970s, people have known about the desert kites of Saudi Arabia. However, scientists have paid surprisingly little attention to them. Archaeologists have been asking for years for more research to be done on the remains of these old communities. And now, things are finally getting started. Archaeologists in Saudi Arabia found a 530-kilometer-long network of lost highways in the northwest of the country at the start of 2022. On these old roads, there were thousands of spiral-shaped stone tombs that seemed to lead from one oasis to the next. Many of these oasis places also had desert kites. Archaeologists who found the roads think that they were used by ancient nomads who were looking for the best places to live and the best weather. Archaeologists are now trying to figure out what they did all those years ago. From this, it can be concluded that Saudi Arabia was once fertile land. But what about its current agriculture? In Saudi Arabia, the water supply, and especially the lack of water, has always been the biggest problem for farming and the main factor in deciding where to grow crops. There are no lakes or rivers in the kingdom. Most of the country gets little rain that comes at odd times. Only in the southwest, in the mountains of Asir near the border with Yemen and making up 3% of the land area, did it rain enough to grow crops regularly. This area and the Tiamat coastal plains to the south were used for subsistence farming. In the rest of the country, farming was spread out and needed irrigation. Along the western coast and in the western highlands, 
groundwater from wells and springs was enough for self-sufficient farms and, to some extent, for commercial production. Moving east, there was some groundwater in the central and northern parts of the interior, in Naj and An-Nafud. This made farming possible, but only in small amounts. The eastern province had the largest number of plantations. The main oasis was in the area near al Hasa, which had a lot of water, natural springs, and mostly good soil. In the past, there wasn't much land that could be used to grow crops, and there wasn't much grassland, so people who raised animals had to move around to take advantage of what food was available. As Saudi Arabia has reached a level of self-sufficiency in the production of various agricultural goods, the country's agricultural sector is primarily focused on the export of goods such as dates, dairy products, eggs, fish, poultry, fruits, vegetables, and flowers to markets in other countries. The Saudi Arabian government has a significant presence in the agricultural sector and subsidizes large-scale farming operations. The Ministry of Environment, Water and Agriculture is the primary agency in charge of formulating the country's agricultural policies. As a result of the government's provision of long-term loans free of interest, as well as low-cost water, fuel and power, as well as duty-free imports of raw materials and machinery, the private sector is also involved in the agriculture of the nation. There are parts of Saudi Arabia, despite the country's widespread reputation as a desert, where the weather is favorable for agriculture. Rainfall occurs in the winter season every year in Saudi Arabia, however, it rarely exceeds 100 millimeters, with the exception of the southern region of the country. Large swaths of the desert have been turned into fields of cultivation, thanks in large part to the efforts of the government in this endeavor. It has been possible to make significant strides in the development of agriculture in the country thanks to the implementation of significant irrigation projects and the adoption of large-scale mechanization. In a report, the Food and Agricultural Organization suggests that giving extra care to building and nurturing the agrosystem in the desert may lead to an interference in the ecosystem of the desert, which would lead to undesirable effects if it were done. So that was all about the video. Hope you find it informative. Then do subscribe to our channel, hit the like button and press the bell icon for more updates like this.